Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I want to begin by thanking the organizers, Professor Pinado and all her colleagues. Uh, it's been a great conference so far, and I look forward to learning more and sharing what we're our research uh, with all of our colleagues here. Um, I'm going to be trying to cover a lot of material. Uh, I will go fairly quickly. Um, John mentioned a new study of ours uh, pointing to a kind of a visual spatial uh, strength that's just now come out in neuroimage. Uh, I may not have time to get to it, but if I go quickly enough, I will. If not, I'll certainly take it up in my session for question and answers at the end. Uh, but what I want to focus on are three broad topics that we've been researching for some time using integrated cognitive and neurobiological measures. And the three broad questions that my talk will address are, how does the brain develop pathways or circuits that support fluent reading? And what are the cognitive factors that underpin it? How does the brain differ in terms of these circuits and pathways in children with dyslexia, and what are the cognitive mechanisms that result in this? And three, how does treatment and remediation moderate those differences? How plastic is the brain of the dyslexic child to respond to treatment, and does that treatment impact some of the neurobiologic anomalies? So even though those are the three broad topics, I'll be presenting a lot of detail, uh, but as we go through it, the big picture comes back to those three. Um, reading is a wonderful thing. This is my favorite uh, temple in Taiwan where we do research. Uh, it's a great uh, uh, historic figure uh, who is a good reader and is able to use reading to explore uh, deep knowledge. Um, and reading is important, so let's go through some of the basics uh, in context. Because again, this is a, a mixed uh, audience of both scientists who will want to know about the neurobiology and the cognition, as well as educators who want to know about the impact on, on the classroom. Um, the development of fluent reading is essential for success in the modern world, and significant numbers of kids in all countries will fail to obtain adequate literacy. For many, this is due to a lack of opportunity, or as Joe Ziegler talked about yesterday, uh, uh, wrong ways of teaching, frankly. Uh, but for some, these will reflect differences that are brain-based. And as we begin to think about the brain basis of reading and reading disability, we need, we're struck with a kind of a stark difference between spoken language and written language. Uh, spoken language is a biological specialization. We are, in some sense, wired to speak and listen. Um, but reading is a relatively recent cultural invention. Um, and spoken language skills are mastered naturally and without direct instruction in most children. Uh, what they need, as you know, uh, is ambient stimulation to develop and tune up the statistical mechanisms that support speaking and listening. By contrast, there is no brain specialization for reading, reading being this new cognitive skill, and significant numbers of kids in all country will, will uh, all languages, frankly, will struggle. And explicit and evidence-based instruction is crucial for the teaching of reading, as we heard yesterday. Um, reading is an exercise in what Stan DeHaan calls neuronal recycling uh, in his wonderful um, uh, book uh, and research over the years. Reading is actually very interesting to cognitive science because it provides a fertile uh, domain to, to study plasticity in each of these areas, learning, uh, perception, attention, memory, language, and higher order cognition. In some sense, the brain needs to solve a puzzle. How do I get from vision into language fast so that I can comprehend and pay attention to the meaning of the text? Well, there are two levels of uh, components that we study in cognitive science on reading. The skill of reading, or the ability to pull the text off the page, decode. This is a bottom-up process that relies on early orthographic and phonological structure, and I'll talk about that briefly, though we heard wonderful presentations from Marais and, and Ziegler yesterday as well. Um, and comprehension. Ultimately, the goal of reading is to understand the meaning of the story. But as you know, children who struggle with reading 
are slow, labored, and error-prone, and this creates a kind of a bottleneck. So if you can't decode the words in the sentence quickly and automatically, it makes it very difficult to comprehend. And indeed, um, if you look at this uh, data from my colleague Don Shankweiler, uh, very large longitudinal studies, um, what you can see is that there is a very tight correlation between decoding fluency and comprehension, especially in the first five years of school. And so the higher the decoding ability, the better the comprehension. There is growing interest, and you will read papers on this, uh, for a, a sort of a subset of kids uh, that seem to decode well but comprehend poorly. And this has become a new area of interest. Uh, some of the younger colleagues at uh, Haskins Laboratories, which I direct, uh, are beginning to look into this. And of course, this great work by Snow and by uh, Kate um, uh, Nation and, and, um, and, and others uh, looking into this. But for the vast majority of kids we're looking at in dyslexia, problems in decoding create a bottleneck, which makes comprehension difficult. Um, and fluent dec uh, decoding is critical. So a skilled adult reader can get from I to meaning bloody fast. And as Joe talked about yesterday, we can come up with good models of the mechanisms that mediate the mapping of orthography to phonology. Uh, if you're a good reader, you can not only decode sight words, but your pseudo word reading should be nearly as fast. And reading disabled children struggle, of course. Ultimately, the building of a reading uh, circuit depends on creating connections between meaning, semantics, phonology, and orthography. And, oops, I'm not sure how to go backwards. There we go. So the child who enters the literate environment already should know uh, several thousand, 17 to 20,000 words on average uh, in terms of their meaning and their phonology, but what they need to do is build the base of this triangle so that they can create an effortless map of this visual representation onto the phonological segments. And whether it's a transparent language like Spanish or Finnish or a deeper orthography like English, uh, similar mechanisms, as you'll see in my talk, are needed. This binding of orthography and phonology is crucial. And we heard a lot about it yesterday. It's wonderful to see the convergence. Ultimately, as we heard yesterday, grasp, grasping the alphabetic principle or becoming able to decode effortlessly and automatically depends initially on phonologic awareness. Now, as John Stein mentioned, uh, reading experience reinforces uh, phonological awareness, but ph phonological awareness also predicts it. And so it is a precondition as well as a beneficiary. Uh, the work of Brian Byrne and others suggests very strongly that pre-literate phonological awareness is a crucial and teachable skill. To build on what uh, we heard yesterday is the development of this alphabetic principle or mapping of letters to sounds. And we know from the talks yesterday and throughout this conference that word recognition is slow labored and error prone, that the vast majority of children with reading disability struggle with phonological operations, including phonological awareness, phonological working memory, and rapid naming, which also hinges on retrieval of phonologic information. And that early deficits in phonological processing make it difficult to build this efficient binding. So this is just a kind of an overview and a summary of what we know from the cognitive point of view. There are a variety of theories, and we heard about a bunch of them. Um, we have to start with the finding that the vast majority of children who present with reading disability struggle with phonological processing and it makes it very difficult to build these efficient and automatic mapping vision into language. And there are, as, I, as we've heard several times, theories that range from, uh, whoops, um, Oh, don't tell me this thing. There it is. So theories that, that argue that the deficit lives in those neural systems that represent phonology to uh, those that map downward into visual sensory motor or auditory processing, uh, access or retrieval deficits, um, procedural learning, 
Uh, Angela will talk about this. Noisy processing. Uh, Joe Ziegler didn't talk about it yesterday, but I love the work that you guys are doing on this kind of signal-to-noise uh, deficits. And um, one of the nice sort of intuitive uh, approaches that uh, Snowling and Hume have argued that, you know, you might have eight to nine to ten different things that can go wrong, and it may just be the case, given the heterogeneity of dyslexia, that there are many, end, many pathways to a common end state. You talked about this yesterday. And, and, and essentially, uh, the cumulative model argues that if you have enough of these risk markers, you may end up with this instability that makes it difficult to build the tight orthography, phonology, mor morphology, and semantic binding, and the automatic decoding. But each of these theories, and they all like to fight one another, um, and there are both singular theories and cumulative theories and heterogeneous theories. They all actually make different assumptions about where in brain the fragile systems are, whether they're in the sensory motor machinery, whether they're in the representation of language, whether they're in access and retrieval of language information, whether they're in the cerebellum or in the basal ganglia. And neurobiological research can be useful in discriminating and contrasting alternative theories. So what is the brain basis of typical and atypical reading development? As we've said several times so far, fast and atom automatic decoding depends on finding the most efficient pathways in brain for getting from vision and out of vision bloody fast and using the machinery of spoken language to do the work of comprehension, syntax, and pragmatics. As we know from the 100 years of lesion studies, uh, and we heard about this yesterday uh, in two of the talks, uh, the machinery and the pathways for perception and production of spoken language depend heavily on perisylvian zones from the inferior frontal gyrus to the superior temporal gyrus and into the parietal cortex. We, these are that wiring for listening and speaking. Uh, and at Haskins Laboratories, we do a lot of work on the basic machinery of perception and action in speech and how speech production and perception depend upon one another. But this is the machinery that will need to be modified by literacy, as you'll see in a few minutes in my talk, in order to become an automatic and fluent reader. So here's an MRI data. This is just any data. This is from a recent study. Uh, I'll, in a few minutes, I'm going to show you four other languages that we've done this study. But this is a simple experiment where we um, contrast written word recognition and spoken word recognition. So the job of the subject is to make a judgment. Is this an animate or an inanimate word? It's a low-level task. But the word either comes to I or to ear. Now, this is a crucial part for my talk, so pay attention. We are showing in this map areas in the auditory cortex that unsurprisingly respond only to spoken words. And these live in primary, secondary auditory cortex. And areas in the visual cortex that respond only to the printed words. No surprise. Vision, V1, and extra striate. Auditory, auditory cortex. But what you can see here in green is something that literacy does to speech. In green are those sets of distributed systems ranging from Wernicke's to Broker's that do not care whether the stimulus comes to eye or ear. Let me say this clearly. These regions shown in green in a literate child are amodal or multimodal. They respond equivalently to print and speech. And as you'll see in a few minutes, this ability to create integration, which depends on these phonologic and orthographic learning mechanisms, is the very strong predictor of individual differences in reading outcomes. And if anything comes through my talk, I want, you'll see I'm going to come back to this. And it was alluded to yesterday in the two talks in the afternoon that ultimately learning to read changes speech and speech I impacts and, 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 and presages uh, learning to read. So 
we've spent many years in many laboratories mapping the broad reading circuit. Um, in my work, I focused on three broad uh, subdivisions over the years that have gotten more refined as we go forward. Uh, an anterior system uh, that, among other things, seems to play an important role in mapping into gestural or articulatory phonology and serves reading by working in conjunction with the broad temporal parietal networks that are crucial for binding orthographic, phonologic, semantic, and morphological codes. And learning to read, as you'll see in a minute, depends on the integrity of this parietal frontal system and its ability to essentially engage in feed forward and feedback learning. And if all goes well, as we heard yesterday, and we will certainly hear from Stan today, if all goes well and reading goes from being accurate and learned to becoming automatic and fast, this is associated with the development of specialization in left ventral cortex in a region that Dahan refers to as the visual word form area. And so the development of the visual word form area depends on the integrity of the learning circuit. And as you can see here, um, ultimately learning to become a fluent reader involves this shift to these fast mapping systems that we heard much about yesterday and we'll hear more about today. Uh, this is just a study from our group years ago uh, where we had 144 children between the ages of 17. This is a 2002 paper. The left hemisphere is on the right side. This is radiological convention. So that is, that's, uh-oh, the left hemisphere. And that's the, the so-called ventral occipitotemporal region. And what we found in children, typically and atypically developing, is that the higher the automaticity of reading, the more the activation of this skill-correlated visual word form system. So we refer to it as a skill zone because it correlated with skill. How do we get this three-part architecture? Again, even our best models uh, are at present overly simplified because they're, they're not understanding the temporospatial dynamics, uh, the feed forward and feedback mechanics. I, I point you to a lot of good work coming out of multimodal imaging where we use fMRI to constrain the uh, spatial organization and MEG or EEG to get the relative timing of these components. Because ultimately a cognitive theory of word recognition needs to understand the timing as well as the spatial organization. Um, I just want to point very briefly to a study that we published last year uh, that was asking this simple question. Given the three-part circuit, and the importance of the so-called VWFA to skilled reading, if we can measure children who are actually building the reading circuit while they're building it, what would the learning circuit look like? It should certainly contain these elements, but it's probably more complex. Because remember I said, reading is an exercise in attention, executive function, working memory, language, and binding. And so in this study, we took a large number of children from a longitudinal study that I'll be talking about later, um, and we, who were at a very young age, the youngest kids we had in this fMRI longitudinal gene brain behavior project. So we had uh, 62 beginning readers, and I want to take a second to describe how we mapped into the learning circuit using behavioral brain correlations. Many of the studies you've been talking, you've been hearing about, and, and some of our own, compare dyslexic and control groups. And that's okay. But dyslexia is ultimately a dimensional disorder. And it is equally interesting to see the difference, not just between RD and control, but poor readers and control, and good readers, poor readers, and superior readers. In other words, the relevant neurobiologic and genetic variation that underpins dyslexia is likely to be gradient or continuous. And we need designs that exploit the full distribution of abilities. And this study, the children range from conventionally dyslexic to superior readers. And so we had three predictors. Phonological awareness, the gold, the, the gold standard. Um, rapid auditory processing, 
And I won't get into the debates about rapid TOJ tasks, except to say uh, that uh, it correlates with lots of other measures. And finally, pseudo word reading. And our dependent measures in this emergent reader brain mapping study were, of course, first, reading ability. How do these predictors go to reading ability? And depending on how they do, how does that map into the brain? So the first thing we did is to look at the correlations. And unsurprisingly, to every study that's ever been done, the correlations among these three predictors are moderately high. So individual differences in phonologic awareness correlate with rapid name, rapid uh, processing, correlate with uh, pseudo-word reading. And so in order to identify the ways in which variants they share versus variants that they don't share map into the brain, we used the partial, uh, we used the principal component analysis. So we pulled the shared variants across these diverse and highly debated measures. This one goes with this theory, this one goes with that theory. We, we simply looked at the common variants, and we also looked using partials at the unique variants. So for those of you who are in research, you understand me. For those who are from the classroom, this is just a way of looking at the, sh the ways in which we, uh, measures relate to one another or distinguish themselves. What was important is when we mapped into the brain and into reading scores, it's only the shared variants that matter. So the unique variants associated with any of these theory-bound measures did not drive reading, and therefore we weren't interested in what they drove in the brain. What they did, what was uh, the common variants, the shared variants, uh, allowed us to map a much more complex emergent learning circuit. So we do find all of the usual suspects, the inferior frontal, the temporal parietal. We don't quite see the VWFA in six and a half and seven year olds, but we see the medial fusiform area beginning to tune itself up in conjunction with attention areas, cingulate gyrus, the precuneus, uh, the parietal, uh, uh, intraparietal sulcus. But here's the interesting thing, and, and Frank, this is for you, my, my, my friend. Um, whoops, backwards. Uh, the strongest predictor, and it turns out, also predicts um, reading outcomes two years later, um, is, sorry, I'm having trouble with this, is uh, this medial to lateral thalamus, dominant in left, and centered exactly on pulvinar uh, and uh, more ventral aspects of thalamus. It turns out that individual differences in ability are not, in, in emergent readers, involve a much richer and more complex circuit than the circuit that comes to either read well or read poorly. The learning circuit is more distributed. It involves attention, precuneus. Now, I'm going to take one second to talk about the pulvinar because you're finding on its uh, appearing to be uh, invariant in, in, um, in structural imaging studies merits uh, some quick discussion of that. Um, just to show you that when we, we map the three separate measures onto this emergent circuit, which includes Wernicke's area, fusiform cortex, and this thalamus centered in uh, essentially a pulvinar. Um, it's a broad swash of activity, so it's thalamus and pulvinar combined. That the higher the reading ability, the more you activate these regions in this emergent sample. And so the initial learning circuit involves not just the cortical areas we tend to talk about, but involves the visual attention areas, the precuneus, the thalamus, and particularly the pulvinar, and other regions that are attentionally sensitive. In other words, the learning circuit involves not just cortex, but cortical, subcortical pathways that need to be more properly understood. Now, one quick point on thalamus and pulvinar. The pulvinar, I am excited about this because it turns out that when we brought the kids back two years later, the activation of the pulvinar predicts reading. We haven't published that yet. That's brand new data. But the pulvinar is associated, among many other things, with visual selective attention. It, in its dorsal aspect, it is interacting with parietal frontal language. 
and in its ventral aspect, it's retinotopically organized. And a lot of research suggests that the pulvinar is crucial for training the ventral visual pathway to create expertise and pattern recognition. And so we think that given the need to develop a VWFA and the fact that the pulvinar is in iterative interaction with everything from V1 all the way to uh, essentially the occipitotemporal juncture, and given its sensitivity to individual differences in beginning readers, we think it's possible that this cortical, subcortical, attention-mediated pathway is a key to whether kids will develop expert pattern recognition or not. This remains to be followed up. I want to share it mainly with the researchers here because I think it opens, and given this intriguing finding you guys had, and I knew about it, on anomaly structurally in the thalamus and centered in pulvinar, it suggests uh, an area we should look at. Sorry, I took too much time. Angela, keep me on track. Okay. So here's the other bulk of what I want to talk about. Uh, and I come from Haskins Laboratories. Those of you who know us know we are ultimately, like uh, Ana Luisa, uh, we are speech, uh, we, we love biology of spoken language. I, I, I am trained by by the masters on phonologic awareness and speech and the intimacy of reading and speech. Uh, my colleague Ignatius Mattingly used to say, reading is parasitic on speech. Becoming an expert reader, uh, as we heard yesterday, is creating these fast mapping into the language brain. And I want to show you what this looks like. So speech print integration, or if you will allow me, creating these green areas. And remember, the green areas are areas that respond equivalently to print and speech. Don't care about the end organ, only care about the linguistic content. We, have, uh, we heard yesterday some beautiful uh, discussion of the bidirectionality of print on speech. So not only does print depend on speech, but learning to read changes speech. So we have evidence from behavior, and we heard about this uh, from Giselle yesterday, that being, being literate impacts the ability to process phonemes in ways that can be beneficial for pseudo-word shadowing or for phonological rhyming on auditory pairs. This is not trivial. The, 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 the speech brain changes when you become literate. And this is the study of Dahan's group uh, showing that modifying the brain, by making it literally, I'm sorry, making it literate, literally changes the activity of speech cortex responding to speech. In other words, learning to read is this kind of amodal or supramodal integration. So in our studies, we've been looking at the other direction, how early phonology and speech predicts the integration of these circuits. How do beginning readers with higher or lower reading readiness, uh, as indexed by, let's say, phonologic awareness, uh, differ in initial organization for print and speech? So in this longitudinal study, children were given two simple tasks, spoken word recognition, printed word recognition. That's going to be the currency of all of my talk. And what we found and again, the left hemispheres on the right side, as per radiological convention, is we found an area deep in speech cortex, in Brodmann's 41, that overlaps very strongly with some of the sites that you guys hit, that shows this relation in seven-year-old emergent readers. Essentially, this area that is a speech area in the left cortex responds mostly and to speech, of course, and it responds equivalently whether you have good phonologic awareness or bad phonologic awareness because it's speech cortex. But what we find the difference is, is that the higher the metaphonological understanding, the understanding that spoken words are made of parts, and we regressed out all the things it's confounded with, like sight word reading and everything else, what we found is that the higher the metaphonological understanding at seven and six, the higher the response of speech cortex to print. So at some level, this might sound trite, but neurobiologically, you have to understand 
we are the, that we are wired to perceive speech. We don't need to understand it. It works. And so learning to read is a, is a challenge of reorganizing speech cortex so that a visual representation goes there, knocks on the door, and produces activation. And so the higher the reading ability, the more amodal or bimodal auditory and visual uh, we see in children in the auditory cortex. And we have, and I, um, uh, uh, this is a very important finding that I've not yet published. So we follow these kids until age nine, and this is a really strong correlation for a two-year difference. So the higher the print speech overlap at time one, the more in which the brain was binding vision and language together in speech, the better the reading scores two years later. So that's a, uh, these are the children here with higher uh, print speech integration in, in, in the auditory cortex at time one. These are the children with lower. And as you can see, this tracks their reading development. So to the points that were made by many yesterday, uh, we can see that learning to read is appreciating the phonology and being able to reorganize language brain to become amodal. And I just want to show this very quickly and try to stay on track. Angela, what time did I start? Where? Um, on your slide. On the screen? On the screen. 16 minutes. Oh, okay. Well, we'll see. I may not get to that really cool study that we just published, uh, but that would be not my fault. Okay, uh, I'll do my best. All right, so um, this is another study that looks at older good and poor readers and looks at text comprehension. And we want to see if there's something analogous to what I just showed you in emergent readers in terms of print speech integration and its relation to skill. So we looked at uh, young adults with good and poor reading comprehension. And we had them either listen to or read text. And we did an fMRI study. And this shows you hypothetical. First of all, we identified those regions in brain, and they fell in left inferior frontal gyrus that were sensitive to syntactic sentential complexity. So we had object and subject relative sentences, and we identified those brain regions that were both sensitive to sentence processing mechanics and didn't care, on average, whether you heard the sentence or you read the sentence. And what we asked is, is there a relationship between how well you read and how much the same cortex, the same tissue, responds to printed and spoken sentences? So in one case, hypothetically, this would be a subject who has very good print speech integration, and this would be a subject for whom printed and spoken sentences are less bound in cortex. And this is what we found. The higher the integration in inferior frontal gyrus, the higher the reading comprehension. So these two studies, and this is a quite a strong correlation for brain on behavior. So this is an in, um, um, integration of modality by reading comprehension measure. And so to summarize, two studies from our lab are reinforcing what we talked about yesterday with speech, re learning to read changes speech, and, and speech changes reading. Um, to indicate that at least um, uh, that in discriminating better and uh, poorer readers, the degree to which they've been able to reorganize language cortex to become amodal or multimodal is crucial to skill. Is this the same in other languages? You've had people come to this country trying to argue that, for example, Spanish or Portuguese is a very transparent language and certainly must, therefore, not need the same amount of phonological mapping and binding. I do work in Chinese, some people, and so does Don. Some people would argue, oh, Chinese is not alphabetic. It doesn't require the same things. But learning to read always involves reorganizing language to allow what? To allow you to go from the visual symbol fast and use the machinery the biology of language to do the comprehension. And so there should be universals. There is evidence, and this is, uh, I like these two new studies, uh, Jose, uh, by uh, uh, Hume and Caravallis in Psych Science, showing that uh, 
in contrast with a lot of claims made between shallow and deep orthographies, that in their studies, fairly well, nicely done studies, I must say, uh, they're comparing Ch Czech and uh, Spanish and English uh, that vary in orthographic depth. Um, they found that the relative balance of phonological awareness, rapid naming, and orthographic knowledge was similar in each of these languages. And so in order to look at this in the brain, this is unpublished data, but hopefully it's about to go out. Uh, we did a four-language study, Haskins, uh, the BCBL, the Bass Center for Cognition, Brain, and Language, Hebrew University, my uh, dear uh, buddy Ram Frost, and, uh, and, uh, and the National Taiwan University System. And we basically asked this question, does print speech integration look similar in all four languages? And it does. So these are normal adults, skilled adult readers, and we are measuring areas that respond only to speech in red, only to reading in the back of the head in, in yellow, and are multimodal in green. And as you can see, the left parietal frontal system has almost identical uh, integration across the four languages. Uh, this is an analysis, and you see the purple in parietal cortex. These are areas where all four languages have a very strong integration. So the suggestion from this preliminary work is that a language as different as Chinese or languages that vary in orthographic depth have this same requirement, which should make sense to your grandmother, that you need to reorganize language in order to become fluent reader. Okay, so what about dyslexia? So we and others have been looking at the neural signature. Remember I started by saying uh, that we were going to be asking three questions. How does the brain build a circuit that allows you to become an automatic reader? And we talked about the cognitive elements, phonological awareness, decoding, routinization, fluency. We talked about the neural pathways, the three-part circuit, and the need to develop a fast mapping system. The possibility that this depends on knowable parietal, I'm sorry, uh, cortical, subcortical pathways that are measurable in children. What do we know about the brain of children and adults who struggle with reading disability? Well, we know in general that there is uh, reports at every level of analysis of anomaly in left posterior cortex, both in parietal temporal and in occipitotemporal regions. Um, and we see this, uh, we tend to see, and in, in certainly when the task demands reading, a tendency for dyslexics to use altered pathways, right homologs and frontal lobe involvement. And as we were among the first to, to look at functional connectivity in dyslexia in this 2000 paper, and what we found is that the critical problem in the dyslexic reader is not just whether some region activates or not, but the degree to which it's talking to other regions or functional connectivity. And so we actually found in this study that the connectivity between the a seed voxel in the angular gyrus and other posterior reading areas was essentially breaking down for print in dyslexics who shifted the connectivity to the right hemisphere. Uh, interestingly, there was good connectivity for, these, uh, for the dyslexics on tasks that did not involve decoding. So there's nothing broken in this circuit. It's just very noisy and poorly connected. And so there's 20 years of work from lots of us in lots of countries showing that the left posterior uh, regions, parietotemporal and frontal, uh, I'm sorry, and occipitotemporal, uh, show anomalies at every level from uh, unstable and reduced activation, including these uh, subcortical contributions, reduced connectivity, uh, and I don't have time to go into this today, but I'm happy to share it. Uh, we've been doing work in a new grant on problems not just in processing, but in learning and consolidation, uh, and offline consolidation in dyslexia. So we're in the middle of an NIH study looking at problems, because dyslexic children, as many of you know, are, are often very bright, certainly there's no relation between IQ and, uh, and, 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 and uh, dyslexia, or not, no reliable one. And, but these children are interesting because as smart as they are, they learn everything by 4 p.m. They go home, they go to sleep, they come back, 
it's often just not sticking. And the not sticking is the subject of uh, some studies we're doing that I don't have time to go in today, but do begin to hinge on procedural learning and other pathways that Angela's looking at. Uh, and then uh, I was all set to say reduced gray and white matter volumes, but this uh, French guy here um, is now arguing that, uh, fortunately I have no dog in that fight, it's not my data. Uh, but um, certainly anomalies, we can debate, are detected. But, as, as uh, Frank said yesterday, all of the work we've done so far with functional and structural imaging does not allow us to separate cause and consequence. Not, not entirely so. We know that at the level of cognition, word identification is slow and labored and rooted in phonological problems. And we know that at the level of circuit, there are anomalies in structure, function, and connectivity. But why? We need to go more deeply to get causal theories. If dyslexia is heritable, and it is, then what are the gene-brain behavior pathways that make one group of readers go here to VWFA and another group of readers get a very fuzzy and unstable and shift to other parts of the brain? What are the gene-brain pathways that cause this? Well, there are a lot of ways to get to it, including studying, learning, uh, experiments on the fly, artificial orthography, etc. But the best way is prospective longitudinal data. And it's critical that we move beyond mere identification of biomarkers toward brain-based causal models that are focuses on how structural and functional differences impede the development of left VWFA for print. Prospective longitudinal studies, therefore, based on gene-brain behavior designs, are at a premium. And in my remaining minutes, I want to share uh, some data from two new studies that we've completed. I want to tell you, I won't have time to go into this, but we're now in, in the new five-year cycle of this NIH grant. We're now looking into preschool. We're using age-appropriate imaging. We're looking at four languages, Chinese, Dutch, Polish, and English, to try to identify the gene-brain pathways that underlie good and poor reading in vastly different orthographies. But in the previous cycle, which was all fMRI-based, we started at age seven because that was the age at which we thought we could get good fMRI data. We examined every four levels of analysis, and we've been publishing this now for the last year or two, and most of the work I'm showing you today is recently published, and I'm happy to share it with you. But we took children at age seven, we did a DNA, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, fMRI, and SMRI structure and behavior, and we tracked them for two years. Some percentage of these kids develop fluent reading and a VWFA, and some percent will not. What is it in gene-brain behavior pathways at time one that predicts these outcomes? So I don't have time to go into this, but late onset of talking, which uh, you cats talked about yesterday, we published a study in Brain a couple of years ago where we identified kids in our sample who had been late talkers. And now they were reading on average more poorly than controls at age seven. And we found anomaly in basal ganglia and thalamus in these children. So we're trying to track that through. Uh, we also found the problems with the cortical subcortical pathways and the pulvinar that I talked about. But the two things that I'm gonna, well, probably one I'm gonna show and I'm gonna skip one, uh, is our new study on neurochemistry. And this is what I wanna share primarily with the scientists here today. Uh, this is a paper that we just published in the last couple of months in Journal of Neuroscience. And we were, for the first time, able to take magnetic resonance spectroscopy measurements in a voxel and stand, this is the voxel here I was talking to you about, uh, in occipital cortex, not my favorite voxel, but this is what the radiologist gave me, um, and quantify while children were watching a movie concentrations of GABA, glutamate, the major inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitters, NAA, N-acetyl aspartate, choline, creatine, et cetera. And so we were able to get these measures and see whether they predicted reading outcomes above and beyond other measures. And indeed they did. So what we found for both choline, 
and for glutamate, the major excitatory neurotransmitter, is that they are, dep uh, is that they are uh, both elevated in the, in the children who are in the dyslexic range. And what we found is the elevated glutamate, which is often associated with white matter anomalies, as well as abnormal cell membrane turnover, was, it was actually a replication, John, um, from some previous adult studies of elevated choline. Uh, but we were the first to be able to see it at the point in time you're building the circuit. And so there seems to be some stability to the elevated choline, which leads us to look at, I think, among other things, into white matter abnormalities. The glutamate finding is the first, we're the first study to look at GABA and glutamate in dyslexia, and certainly in children. And however, in both autism and ADHD, elevated glutamate and choline is frequently reported. Indeed, there are theories of ADHD, which is very comorbid with dyslexia, uh, that are called hyperexcitability theories. Theories that are rooted in the idea that a failure to downregulate glutamate results in noisy processing systems. And there's also a hyperexcitability theory in autism. And so I'm very intrigued by this because when we brought the children back two years later, the relationship between elevated choline and poorer reading was stable. So it appears that there's a neurochemical element that is associated with poor reading outcomes and problems in plasticity and organization of this circuit. MRS, MRS is helping to open a new window because if we can get into the neurochemistry, we can get back to some interesting genes and up to some issues of plasticity. I do not want to overstate this, so let me be clear and concise. The finding on choline abnormalities seems to be replicable and robust and needs to be understood. The finding on glutamate has been found in other similar populations and needs to be understood because it may very well go to the kinds of phenomena that people like Nina Krauss show where even the simplest auditory brainstem response is very noisy in this population. And the last point on this, the work of Joe Leturco that John Stein alluded to with both uh, uh, with uh, DCDC2 and, and Kia 319 um, in animal models, that the knockout and knockdown has been associated with hyperexcitability in auditory cortex and with hyperglutamatergic function in one of their other studies. So Leturco and I are now talking about trying to see whether the genes that drive glutamate GABA balance might also be driving some of these anomalies. So stay tuned, and I'm sorry to go on in detail, but this is opening a new door. I'm gonna skip over the genetics. Uh, just to tell you, if you're interested, and I can talk about this later, we have DNA on all these kids. We just recently published a paper in, uh, with uh, Landy et al. and my colleague Elena Grigorenko, who's not here yet, I think, but she's gonna be here. Uh, where we were able to find a sensical relation between the valmet allele in Compt, brain activation and behavior. And we're continuing to pursue that. Okay, so the last slides, and I promise I'll go quickly, Angela. Don't look at me like that. Um, a brief look at remediation. So we've, we've asked the question, how does the brain build circuits? And we know that this three-part system is important and that the VWFA is muy importante. And we know that dyslexics show noisy and unstable activity, shifts to the left, probably abnormal uh, biochemistry, uh, certainly abnormal function. The question is, is it malleable? RD readers do not show the VWFA in, no in the absence of treatment. Does treatment normalize this? And so are these left and under-engaged left hemisphere systems fundamentally disrupted or, or are they simply noisy and trainable? And can remediation focus on what? On evidence-based work, phonological awareness, decoding, alphabetic principle, vocabulary, routinization. Does that normalize these brain pathways? Well, we did a study and published uh, some years ago with Dr. Benita Blackman at Syracuse who developed an absolutely terrific uh, nine month treatment, 15 minutes a day, five days a week, nine months, e reinforcing all the things that Jose talked about yesterday. We looked at the brain before, after, and importantly, one year follow up. Most studies don't do that. 
And we had two control groups, typically developing and dyslexic children who were getting school-based treatment, but not this intensive treatment. The key behavioral result, or I would not show you the brain, was that the treatment uh, group improved relative to the control groups. And this is what happened in brain, shown in w just one image. This is the time one versus two versus one year follow-up. And in left hemisphere, remember the left's on the right, in all three parts of the circuit, including the VWFA, the treatment group, but not the controls, increased activity. And what we found in the right hemisphere, which is on the left, is an inverse relation, which is what we see in typically developing children. As you become more automatic in the left, the right hemisphere and the frontal lobe play a reduced role. And this is exactly what we found in the treatment group. So this is exciting, of course. Uh, and there are a growing number of other studies looking at different approaches, showing plasticity and modulation of these weak and noisy left hemisphere circuits. And some, Frank, I don't know what, uh, what's up with them, but um, showing gray and white matter changes in temporal parietal as well. We thus have evidence that appropriate training can normalize uh, at-risk readers. The left posterior system appears unstable but trainable. But here's the problem. If you respond to treatment, the brain changes. If you don't, it doesn't. Duh. What makes some kids respond and others not? So we put together, we just got funded last year. We're very excited. And I'm going to end pretty much with this, Angel. Sorry. Um, uh, a new program grant at NIH with uh, Georgia State University and Hospital for Sick Children, Maureen Lovett who has developed an incredibly good evidence-based treatment called FAST, P-H-A-S-T. And over 20 years, they've studied thousands of children, and the majority of kids respond, and some don't. And so in this new grant, which involves computational modeling with Mark Seidenberg, Jason Zevin, uh, brain imaging pre and post, measures of procedural and declarative learning systems, we're trying to answer for the first time not what is the difference between dyslexics and controls. Been there, done that, all of us. But what's the difference between RD children who look the same in behavior, but one group is going to move and the other group is not? What is it we can see in their deep systems that might give us a clue so that we can do this? Hopefully, we can find what works for those children because not all children respond in the expected way. So as we go more deeply into remediation and treatment, we, there is the hope, at least, that we can begin to address um, uh, a much larger percentage of children in this heterogeneous and complex condition. And I'm skipping this, tr uh, the thing John mentioned. Oh, you would have liked it so much, but uh, I'm okay, done. Ed. And I just want to end with this slide, Angela. Um, so we are um, continuing to pursue these things, and I want to thank my colleagues. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Ken.